Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to explain events in Viper. And I'll show you two use cases for events. One is a way to send notification to a user interface. And another using events as a cheap storage. So first of all, what are events? Well, events allow you to record that something happened on the blockchain. Unlike a state variable, smart contracts will not be able to access events that were fired in the past. So now let me show you an example of an event. Let's imagine that we have a function called transfer and it transfers the amount of ether that is stored in this contract to this address over here. And we'll have the code to do that over here. So after we actually transfer the ether to this address over here, we want a way to record that this transfer happened. And we can do that by using events. So we'll first declare event. So we'll name it transfer. And what are some data that we want to log in this event? Well, we'll want to record the sender. And it will be of type address. We also want to record the receiver. And this will also be an address. And lastly, we probably want to record the amount of ether that was transferred. And this will be of type uint 256. And that is how you declare an event. And to fire an event, you would say log, followed by the name of the event. In this case, it will be transfer. And inside the parentheses, you will put the parameters. So the sender will be message.sender. The receiver will be the to address and the value will be the amount. So let's see an example of this in Remix. Inside Remix, we'll start by activating Viper. And then we'll create a file called event.by and then paste the code. And then we'll click on the Viper icon and then compile the code. The code compiled without any errors, so let's deploy it and call this function transfer. So we'll deploy the event contract, scroll down, and we'll call this transfer function with the address of this account. Paste it here, and for the amount, I'll just put in one, two, three, and then hit transfer. This is the transaction that we just created. Let's now see what's inside it. So I'm going to scroll down and I am looking for logs, which I can see it here. The important thing to remember here is that this log will be stored on the blockchain, but you won't be able to access it inside your smart contracts. This is the reason why events can be used as a cheap storage. So back inside the event that was fired, I can see that the name of the event was transfer. The sender is this address. The receiver is this address. And the value that was logged was one to three. Now, if you have a user interface that is listening for events from this smart contract, when this event is fired by calling the function transfer, they will receive a notification saying that this function was called with these parameters. So that's the basics of events. You declare them using event and you fire them using log. Let's now talk about indexes for events. Putting index on an event argument will allow you to quickly filter out the event by a particular value. So for example, if I put the keyword indexed on the sender, then you'll be able to quickly filter out all of the transfer event where the sender is equal to a particular address. Likewise, if you put an index on the receiver argument, then you'll be able to filter out the transfer event where the receiver is an address that you're interested in. Now, one thing that you should keep in mind is that up to three indexed argument is allowed per event. So for example, if we had more parameters for this event, then we can only index three of these parameters. So 
putting index on next is still valid since we only have three index. But if we also put it on y, now this is invalid since we now have four indexes. The next example that I'm going to show you is using events as a way of cheap storage. So let's say that we want some access control for this contract, meaning that certain functions can only be executed if that address is authorized. So here we have two functions that will grant authorization to an address and also revoke authorization from the address. And we use a hash math to either authorize an address in that case, we'll set it to true. And in the case of revoking uh, authorization from an address, we'll set the hash map at the address to false. So we have a basic way to authorize an address. But how do we list out all of the addresses that's been authorized? One way to do that is using arrays. So every time you authorize an address, you will push this address into an array. And every time you revoke an authorization from an address, you will remove that address from the array. But here, I'm going to show you a cheaper way of doing it using events. So back at top, first, I'm going to declare an event. And I'll name it authorized. And it's going to log the address that was either granted authorization or revoked authorization. And I'll name this argument ADDR, short for address. And we probably want to index this parameter, so I'll put indexed, and it's going to be of type address. We want to know if this address was either granted permission or revoked permission. So we'll log another parameter, I'll name it authorized, and it's going to be boolean. Next, scrolling down, when an address is granted permission, I'll log authorized. for the address and true. When we revoke an authorization, we'll log the address with the value false. So how does using log serve as a cheap storage? How can we list all of the addresses that's been authorized? Well, you would do it like this. First, you would get all of the authorized events from earliest to latest block. And for each authorized event, if the address has been authorized, then you set the authorized to true. And if this event was fired, then you set the address to false. After looping through all of the authorized events, you'll be able to create a list of addresses that are currently authorized. Those are two examples of events for user interface and for cheap storage. Thanks for watching and see you later.